Good evening, everybody. Um, so thank you for inviting me along to talk tonight specifically about adding value to your property. Um, so I'm assuming that you've already gone and got to that stage where you found a property that you like. But um, look, I'm a qualified designer, a serial renovator, and a practicing house doctor. And when I first got to New Zealand and picked up my, picked up my practice as a house doctor, it kind of caused a bit of confusion. And uh, I used to get questions like, do you, do you treat pe patients at your home? Or, or, or do, you, um, do you go to their home and treat them? And I was like, oh, God. Um, I'd no sooner um, prescribe a medical remedy for my mother then I would get my husband to build an extension on our house. So that's certainly not what I do. Um, so before I talk um, about adding value to your property, I might just sort of educate you a little bit about what a house doctor is. Um, so you can get an understanding of kind of where I'm coming from and how it can benefit you when you're buying a property specifically to add value to um, and sell on. Um, so, <laughs> Strangely, house doctoring does have some synergies to the general medical profession in the way that we operate. Um, I think Tony might disagree here, but um, I think your uh, health is actually your biggest asset. If you don't have your health, you can't work and you can't create an income. So, but next to that is then your property. That's your next biggest asset. We all go to the GP. We all look after our bodies, we may go to the gym, we may have a bad diet, we may have a good diet, but needless to say, we take care of our health in a way that is similar to what we should take care of with our house, if that makes sense. So if you're investing in your health, you should invest in your house too and make sure that it is um, there for the long term and it will hold you right and get you where you need to go. So when you invite a house doctor into your home, um, it's kind of like having a medical examination with your GP, except we're not examining you, we're examining your house and the way you live. And we'll spend a little bit of time kind of getting to know you and um, understand what it is that you want to achieve, what your objectives are. You're going to sell it on, you're going to live there. Um, who's going to live there? How are you going to use it? What's your lifestyle like? And we get an understanding then of how the property needs to perform. If you're selling it, it's a slightly different strategy, and we need to understand who the target market is. But either way you look at it, it's kind of, it is a strategy, and you have to work backwards. You have to have a goal, you have to have an objective, and you work out a plan to meet those objectives within budget and within the right time frame. So house doctors are um, very similar to interior designers. I am a qualified interior designer. I, I studied in the UK for seven years total. Um, I understand that degrees are three years here. Um, but then I kind of got very interested in um, return on investment, and that was my key focus. It's like, I can create beautiful statements. Interior designers can create beautiful statements. But what I wanted was something more quantifiable. House doctoring is actually uh, quite well known in Europe and in, in, uh, in the States as well, but not so much here. And when I got here, I was kind of surprised that people weren't looking at their properties as an investment and really enhancing the positives and taking away the negatives to create value. I guess you guys didn't really need to at some stage because property was just booming, right? So now it's getting to the stage where it's really hard for you guys to get into the market. And you've got to be creative. You've got to think outside the box. You've got to work out a way where you can get your foot on the ladder of property investment. And so you have to be even more careful about what you're buying and how you're developing it to be able to get you to that next step to where you want to be. So adding value. <laughs> so... Um, Assuming you've got all your ducks in a row and you've spoken to the right professionals, you've been to see a financial health advisor, hello, um, you've listened to um, the economists in the world and um, you've really taken on board everything that you need to know. It's important you go see a lawyer, a financier, um, you talk to your real estate agents, you gather all your data and you work out what it is that you can afford to buy and where you can afford to buy it. You make sure you have a pre-approval and you make sure that you have 
your creative investment protected. <laughs> so whether that is buying with your mum, your dad, your family, your friends, um, whatever your situation might be, cross your T's, dot your I's. Then, only then, can you start looking in the area that you want to buy in. Um, and look, you might have to compromise. You can't buy a house in Auckland at the moment, or even anywhere outside of Auckland within decent commuting distance for less than a million, right? Maybe. Maybe it's cosy. <laughs> or uh, what was the word you used? Potential. Um, you know, or one of a kind. <laughs> but um, how I look at it is that you kind of like buy in that green band. And that's how I started in London, actually. I used to work on Tottenham Court Road and I kind of wanted to be quite central, but no way could afford it. So I started looking at the areas around um, the South Circular and still couldn't afford Clapham or anywhere like that. But digging deeper, I looked into the infrastructure of the area and where tube lines were going out to, where train lines were going out to, where counts were going to put money into hubs of infrastructures and lo you know, local amenities. And I ended up buying this, um, this is my first, first, first project, I ended up buying this first floor um, apartment in a Georgian building in Forest Hill real dive at the time. <laughs> but within two years, it paid off because it, it used to take me an hour and a half to get from Forest Hill to Tottenham Court Road. But when the tube line got out there, it took me half an hour. And all of a sudden, the whole area went boom. And I sold that property probably only about five years later for about four times as much as I bought it for. So that was just pure luck. But you can still do something similar here. So perhaps buying outside of um, the area you want to be in, but start working in towards that area by adding value. So be smart. Have your strategy, like a marketing strategy, like a business strategy. Have your end goal, where you want to be in 10 to 20 years' time. Work backwards and then start doing the research in the area that you can afford that your budget allows you. But don't max out your mortgage. You've always got to keep a little bit in your back pocket to bribe him. <laughs> um, you never know where you're going to need it. And you can pay off your mortgage quicker if you don't need it. Just pay off the extra. Um, so adding value to your home, this is what you really want to know, isn't it? <laughs> That's why I'm here. Um, I think the key for your first home, guys, is not to take on too much of a bigger project, okay? It could absolutely devour you if you are not skilled in the industry or you got, haven't got connections or you naturally don't have time. You may be a busy parent and you work full time. You've got to be there 24-7 if you're going to project manage your own full-blown renovation. So the best kind of property to buy is that one that has what we call good bones, a good, healthy home um, that has the right number of spaces, ticks all the right boxes, is in a good area, um, you've checked the, the location, you've been there a number of times, there's no nuisance neighbours, there's no barking dogs, there isn't, you know, schools are pretty good, public transport's pretty good. Those have all ticked your boxes. The quality of your house needs to give you what you need, but allow you room to put your own kind of, I guess, stamp on your property. Um, without spending too much. So, to look for a healthy home, start by doing the check yourself. Look for things like termites and pests, any evidence of that. If you can get underneath the floor, check the floorboards. Those are the biggest things that can cost quite a lot um, to replace if you need to. Check the wiring, um, check the water pressure, go around, turn on all the taps. <laughs> uh, don't use the toilet, but <laughs> turn on all the taps and check the drainage as well. Plumbing's key. Check for damp patches, check for anywhere that maybe someone has actually painted over damp. That happens quite a lot, you know, the quick old band-aid over a gaping wound sort of thing. So just run your hand along the walls, go into the bathroom, look for mould, check for those sorts of things because those are the, those are the ones that will eat your budget up and you basically want none of that there. Um, and don't forget the outside as well. God, so many people go in there and they're so excited about buying the first home that they're already moving in the furniture, they're already painting the walls, and they've forgotten to actually go and check outside and look up. Look at the roof, check the gutters, check the downpipes. Um, look at all the sort of light fittings and switches as well. Um, 
Also trees, they're a big killer as well. <laughs> so it's lovely to have a garden full of trees, but just check. If they're old or looking like they're falling down, um, those can be really expensive to remove. So just um, be careful about that. So once, once you have actually had um, a good check through yourself and you know that it's the house that you want to buy, um, it's, this is a step I always say, guys, please don't skip. And I know we've touched on it before, but a, a full building report is really important. Not, I mean, it's expensive. So I know when you're on tight budget, you just think, where can I cut costs? So, okay, um, my mate's a builder. I'll bring him around, and if he says it's okay, I'll buy it. You can take that risk, but if it ends up badly, you could not have any money back in your back pocket to do what you want to do. So um, do get a building report. And if anything crops up in that building report, you can use it as a negotiation tool. Is that right? You can? You can kind of go, well, this needs replacing. If it's a for sale and not an auction, obviously, because you have to take that. Um, but yeah, it is really important to keep. And then you kind of know what you're up for when you are planning your renovation, what you've got to spend your money on. So, um, so the key is to plan really well what, you're, you know, what you need to do. So if you are renovating to sell your property on, like, so if it's part of your big plan and you're wanting to keep it for two to five years, maybe you're going to rent it out, maybe you're going to live there, but it's the step to the next project, then this is really important to go and have a chat to your real estate guys um, and understand who your potential target market would be in that area. And also look at other properties in that street or the area that have sold that have a similar spec, so similar number of rooms, similar size, that sort of thing, and what they're selling for when they've been done up. The difference between your purchase price and the, you know, the average in that street is kind of what you can spend on your renovation. It used to be that you could spend 10% of the value of your property, and you should expect to get double that, double your spend back in your profit. But I think nowadays there's no hard and fast rule. Um, so it's always just a good idea just to talk to the professionals and get an idea of what your safety net will be and then put that budget aside. Then start looking at what you need to, um, what you can improve on. Now, there's, I've written lots of articles before um, on improving the value of your home. And, you know, there's, there's lots of media saying, you know, the kitchens and bathrooms are the biggest amount of value. And they do. I mean, kitchens can up, add up to 15% of the value of property if done well, and 10% 10, 10 for bathrooms. But um, if you guys are, are tight with your money, uh, you don't need to go a full-blown sort of makeover. Start from the outside in. And the reason why I do this is because a buyer will make up their mind on a property within the first five to eight seconds of pulling up to your house. So curb appeal is actually the biggest draw card. So walk through, tidy up your, your, you know, your, your front entrance. Make sure you've got a strong visual lead up to a strong front door. Um, replace that tired old letterbox and things like that. Start there. Then quick fixes that will add a, a huge impact to the value of property that won't actually break the bank and you won't need consent for is things like you know, changing your hardware and upgrading your taps, your, you know, um, uh, your lighting fixtures and fittings, changing out your lights and putting LED in. On that note, um, I'd say getting a good lighting designer in is worth the weight in gold because lighting can really make or break a property. And if you want to sell it on, then you really need to create that space, uh, that, that, that illusion of space and light. And um, to do that, you need a good lighting plan or maximize your natural light as best you can. So, um, yeah, so improving from the outside in is the first place I'd start. And then changing all the fixtures and fittings, upgrading those bits and pieces. Flooring is actually a really big thing for me. Um, if you think about it, it's like kind of logical because it's a, a huge part of your house. It's your, it's your biggest, it's the biggest expense in your house, and it also gets um, a huge amount of traffic. So it's really important that you get this right. If you're lucky enough to have bought uh, an older home that's got some original floorboards, and um, you can just sand those back. You know, if you've bought a, like a an, an 1800s, 1900s villa, or you know, 1950s 
40s, 50s bungalow that's likely to be Kauri, Mas Kauri Masai, uh, Rimu, and they would have been done originally in this sort of um, oil-based polyurethane, which actually makes the, the, the floors very orange and very red over time. You'll be quite surprised if you strip those back and add a 2% white tint into your water-based polyurethane, you'll get a really beautiful contemporary floor that is quite natural and light. And, and I do believe that natural products do actually help help enhance um, a property's value as well. So keeping everything in natural fibers, um, it's timeless and never go out. So yeah, the floor is the way you need to invest. Now, the other thing about the floor is if you're in a small property, try not to um, cut your flooring up with too many break lines. It's best to try and keep it to one or two materials. Um, that just makes your property feel a lot smaller. So if you want to try and create the illusion of space, go for the wide floorboards, put it through all your common areas, and then carpet the bedrooms for warmth. Um, try not to do... <laughs> I bought a flip project recently, which was... Um, and this will be an interesting story for later. But it's a two-year-old house, interestingly, not an old house. And... Um, we decided to buy it because it was affordable and I could see the potential in it. But it was a spec home um, and very kind of, well, it, it looked like it had been done in the 1980s, actually. <laughs> it was really badly done. But it had like a, a square um, section of tiles in the entrance. Then it was carpet and carpet in the dining room. Then another square section of tiles in, in the kitchen. And then there was something else and then carpet everywhere else. And to be honest, it was just a mishmash and it just looked terrible. We pulled it all up and we put um, wide timber floors throughout and it just changed the whole space. It looked clean, contemporary, large, light. It was beautiful. It was all that was needed. So, flooring, choose wisely. <laughs> also, every type of floor has a different function and form. So, if you're going to rent it out, maybe timber flooring isn't the right thing to do unless you're standing back. But there's some great laminate products out there that will last a lifetime and look just as good as timber and will be just as good when you sell it in 10, 5, 10 years' time. So, do talk to the experts, talk to the professionals, get your product knowledge up there before you buy stuff. So, yeah, upgrading kitchens. So, if you're on a tight budget, like I said, you don't need to um, pull the whole kitchen out. If it, work, if it generally works and you've got enough space, um, try to reuse the carcass. You can take the cupboard, cabinet fronts off, respray them, change the handles, um, Make sure you've got enough storage as well. If you, this flip project that we had, had like one bench and then uh, there was nothing above, just a range hood, there was no space. So we um, filled in the top with um, cabinets and an integrated range hood. And we also flipped a cupboard around that was sort of uh, in a bedroom that was kind of on the other side of the kitchen wall and created another sort of bench bar area. Bingo, transformed. 10 grand later and it looked like a brand new kitchen. You can change tops as well, um, add LED lighting underneath cabinets and things like that. And, and you really don't have to spend a fortune, you just need to be clever. Make sure, first of all, that everything is functional and efficient because that is the key to selling a house, that it has to flow and move easily. Um, you, what you want is for the, the buyer to come in and go, there's just something about this house, not... I'm not sure why I don't like this house. And those are the kind of projects I get, right? That you, that you walk, they walk into the space and they're like, it ticks all my boxes, it's got the right number of room, but it just doesn't feel right. And I don't know what it is. And they start fixating on things that they want to change. Usually, it's a lack of efficiency, flow, and light, stagnant energy. So that's what we come in and fix and make sure it all works. So, um, bathrooms are the next things you can upgrade. Um, they can cost up to 20 grand if you do it properly. <laughs> so be careful about what you do there. Just make sure everything works and it's functional. Um, if you're selling it on, you don't, know, you don't need to go and put in, you know, the you know, top spec vanity and marble tops and, you know, latest shower head. It, that's money down the drain. You need to make sure it works and you can t pick a medium range price um, that is 
equivalent to the market or related to the market that you want to pitch your house at, um, and that will sell it. As long as it's functional, it's light and it's airy and it makes you feel comfortable in that space, that will sell it. The danger, bringing me on to the sort of final point really, the danger for you guys is emotion. <laughs> so when you buy your house and you're so excited about renovating it, you, and, and it was a part of that original plan of like, I'm going to sell it on two years time. You can get really caught up with uh, the excitement of it all and you might end up buying this really expensive chandelier or, you know, something else that's quite personal and unique to you and it won't give your money back. So stay the course, steady the course, go back to your strategic plan, what you're trying to achieve, keep, keep to your budget and... Um, Ensure that you're not overspending, that you're always keeping things on track. Because, um, yeah, if you just get too emotionally involved, there is a danger of overcapitalizing. So I think the key message for me now, and I'm going to finish here, is um, plan well, really well, like it was a business, okay? Um, talk to the professionals, even I do, I've, I've spent years in, in study, but I, I did a lighting, um, sort of lighting design module in my degree, but I don't claim to be a, a lighting designer and I always outsource it. The reason why is technology moves so fast that I can't be an expert in everything. So I will go to the experts and I'll ask advice and I'll pull together a strategy for a client. So you guys... Go to the experts, speak to people with the product knowledge, pull together the ideas and make sure it all works for you. So plan, strategize and keep to budget and keep, to, um, keep, keep your goal in mind and enjoy it. It's a great process. If you do it well, you will enjoy the journey and you will get there. To the, you'll get your dream house in Remuera with the pool and everything like that. But start small, everyone else has done. Um, and build up part of his business plan. Thank you. <laughs>